All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to move this forward. How's everyone doing? Everyone doing all right? Some nods here. Tired? Um, you know, after the daylight savings, it feels like the days are either too short or too long. I don't know which one it is. It gets too dark too early. I know that. Um, again, I want to welcome you. I'm Pastor Matt. I serve here as the as an English pastor. And today we're continuing our, our sermon series in the book of Proverbs, uh, Wisdom from the King, How to Live a Wise Life. And today we're going to talk about something, um, I think oftentimes in most churches, if, in my experience, most churches I've been to, most Christians, is something that at times we can feel uneasy about. Something that, that we uh, often can, can actually fear. And we're going to talk about today is Confession and repentance. Confession and repentance. Now, why does this, what does this have to do with living a wise life? Now, we have to remind ourselves that the book of Proverbs, the whole point of it was to guide God's people on how to live as his people, to set them apart so that, that as they live in the wisdom of God, that as they lived out his principles and his, rule, not his rules, but um, as they lived out um, uh, their faith, that they would shine a light on who God is. And, and, and we are in such desperate need of that in our world now. You know, in the video announcements, you know, Pastor Chu just talked about how there's opportunities and Tracy opening up with that, that theme park. I think it's called Spirit of California. I looked it up. It's going to be massive. It's going to be huge. And there's opportunities there. And there's opportunities here in Milpitas. But the reality is, of the, uh, reality is this, is that if God's people do not live as they are called, if we do not live according to how God has called us to be, to be that light in this world, then it doesn't matter what opportunities are there because we're not shining people, uh, we're not showing people who Jesus is. We can put on programs, we can put on great events, but it's the lives of his people that God uses to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, when we talk about confessions and repentance, I don't know what you think about that. Maybe some of you guys start cringe, or maybe some of you guys are a little scared. Maybe some of you guys haven't even thought about it. But I often, I think about this sometimes, and you don't have to raise your hands or anything, anything like this, but I know there's some of you here, but have any of you guys ever gotten a call or an email from Pastor Chu, our senior pastor, and it, all it said was, hey, do you have time to meet? Or, hey, can I call you? Those can be some of the most frightening words you can ever hear. Because what's going through your mind is like, what did I do? Did I do something wrong? And, and I find that even for me, when I, when I ask people to meet up and hang out, they find that maybe I have some agenda or I have some secret insight into their life and I'm, I'm there to expose everything, right? Now, sometimes that is true. But we carry this fear in us of, of, of the sin or the things that we are ashamed of or that we feel guilty about that we don't want to come to light. And I think one of the, the, again, one of the scariest phrases or one of the, the things that causes our heart to kind of race a little bit faster is if we go to someone and we just say this dead face, it's like, I know what you did, right? I know what you did. And it, you might not have not even done anything, but immediately your mind's going to say, did I do something? Or if for most of us, and I believe this is the case, is that often there's things in our lives that go unconfessed. Hide away and keep in the dark, and, and we're so scared to let it out. We're like, oh no, does, does the pastor Matt know? Does Pastor Chu know? Or do my friends know this about me? And we carry on in this, this fear. And we carry on this, maybe this guilt or this anxiety of what if someone actually knew what I did? What if someone actually know, knew who I really did? am what i hide from the rest of the world that when i put on my clothes and i come to church this morning i'm putting on this happy face a smiley face maybe this holy face but deep down there are things in my life that are unconfessed there are things that are in rebellion against god and we're so scared to let others know and what it does is that it creates this this fear and this anxiety within us and we feel uneasy and we feel, we feel scared. And so anytime maybe a preacher, one of the pastors or someone tells you, hey, confession and repentance is a good thing. It's hard for you to see that. 
You see, I think oftentimes our view of what it means to confess our sins, what, a view of what it means to expose everything about our life, we see it, it makes us uneasy, uncomfortable, and we see it with eyes of fear. Because all we see is the negative aspects of this. It's like everyone is going to know. Or the people that in my small group are going to know. Or my brothers and sisters in Christ are going to know. And we actually fail to see that in confession and in repentance is actually an act of incredible grace and love by our God. That it's actually a beautiful thing that when the, pe- when the people of God can open, the, open their lives and say, yes, this is who I am in all of my sin and all of my dirtiness and all of my shame. And yes, even though this is here, I know I have a God who loves me. A God who has forgiven me. But it's in our human nature to try to hide our weaknesses, to hide our guilt and our shame. Today we're looking at the, um, the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs verses, uh, chapter 28, verse 13, it says this. Whoever conceals his transgressions, his transgressions, anything that violates the law of God, anything that goes against his rule, which is basically what we call sin, will not prosper. This word prosper means like to thrive in this life. This this aspect of like the blessed life, right? But he who confesses and forsakes them, which means to turn away from this, not just about saying I did wrong, but saying, no, I don't want to do it anymore. I want to turn from it. It says that them, uh, forsakes them, will what? Obtain mercy. Now, I want to be real quick and and say this real quickly about the book of Proverbs because oftentimes we we will open up the book of Proverbs and we read it actually incorrectly because we view these as promises of God. And in reality, actually what the book of Proverbs are, the book of wisdom, are these are general principles. Right? And, and that's important for us because we know that the wicked prosper in this world. Right? We know that people do evil and they get away with it. And we also know that good people suffer. So how is it that this rings true, though? How is it that when God speaks of this, that those who conceal their sins or hide their sins will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy? Now we need to look beyond just the here and the now, but we continue to look on into eternity as well. And we're going to get a little bit to that. But when we understand Proverbs for, uh, chapter 28, some of the background of that is the book of Proverbs was a collection uh, of wise sayings, I guess you would say. And, and Proverbs 25 verses 29 was a collection that was gathered by King Hezekiah. Now, what we know about him is that he was a man known to, who was, uh, sorry, it was, uh, who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, if you understand the, the history of kind of, of, of Judah and Israel's kings, oftentimes they were wicked and evil kings who turned God's people away. And King Hezekiah was one of those few and those rare good kings who, who loved the Lord, who served the Lord. And he actually led a revival in that time. He tore down uh, idols and altars to, to other gods. And he, he ushered in um, a, a time of revival for God's people. And part of his plan was to collect the, the, the Proverbs of Solomon, who Pastor Justin in the previous week talked about was the, the wisest man in this world after Jesus. Right? And so when we understand that what he, why he collected this was that it was meant to lead God's people to live in the wisdom of God. It was to keep them holy. It was to live in accordance to, to God's good design. See, when we talk about wisdom, oftentimes we just think about, oh, it's being smart, excuse me, being smart or knowing what to do. But it's much more than that. When the wisdom we talk about God says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And what that means is that you have a right view of God first. First and foremost, that's what we need. And, and God, and, and as we understand who God is, then our desires and our, and our actions align with his. And we learn to apply his truths, not ours, his truths, which are ultimate. And we know how to apply them at the right time and in the right way. And this passage here is so important because when we talk about what it means to live a wise life, We're speaking about how to live a life that, yes, is abundant, a life that is is peaceful, a life that has hope and joy in it, but also in reality that it faces tragedy and the brokenness of this world, that it deals with the hardships and the sins. And so to live a wise life requires us to, to be open about 
what is actually going on in our lives. To be transparent about our sins. And we need to understand this because I think sometimes we, we minimize. We minimize our sin. I say this often times is that for most Christians, and even for most of us here in this room, we don't view ourselves as sinners. We view ourselves as good people who sin on occasion. But that's totally false. The, the reality is, is truly that we are desperately and greatly, dangerously sinners. Sinners in need of grace. But somehow in our mindset, we think that we can keep our sin away from others. That somehow we can hide away our sin from God, even though we know he knows it all. So we talk about the dangers of our hidden sin. Now, probably one of the most popular stories of, of um, our acts of sin is by King David and in his adultery and his affair with Bathsheba in, in, in um, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11. And I'm not going to read it for you, but just to summarize it with you, King David, who was known as a man who was after God's own heart, he's taking a stroll in his palace and, and on the rooftop, and he, and he notices a woman who's bathing. And he's overcome by, by his lust. And so, you know, as the king, basically, he can have whatever he wants, and no one can say anything. And so it doesn't that he goes in secret. He tells his, he tells his servants to go get her to bring her to the palace. And he, he lays with her, and as she gets her pregnant, now, at this point, you can think he already did uh, wrong enough, right? But to hide his sin, what does he do? He sets out power and plotting the murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. And I'm not going to get into all those details, but he succeeds in that. And, and he carries on with his life. You know, I, I think that's something that, that we don't, don't necessarily see. See, he doesn't really, at that time, he doesn't recognize sin that's been in his heart, the sin that he has committed. Is it until the prophet Samuel comes to me and, and, and it comes to him and exposes to him the sin in his life and David in recognizing his sin, he, he cries out and in agony and, and in mourning knowing that he has sinned against God. And, and, and he expresses this in Psalm chapter 32 verses 1 to 3. And he says this, he says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. And verse three is where I want to keep, uh, keep it. It says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I say, Allah, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgress transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Verse 3. You know, sometimes we, we are really good at hiding our sin. We're really good at hiding the things that we don't want other people to know. But there are real consequences here and now for that. And David, he says that example. He says, when I kept silent, Right? Does that sound familiar? Whoever conceals his transgressions. My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. See the guilt beating up at him. And we know that what guilt and shame can do to us. It holds on to you and it, and it drags you down far longer after you've done that or after the incident or the thought of it has passed up. We understand that guilt and shame, it, it can isolate us. Right? Again, it's that fear of what if people find out. Will they love me? Will they accept me? And rather that fear of being exposed, we tend to hide away from other people. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean we lock ourselves in our room, but I, I can bet you that some of us here now, when we go into a small group and we ask for prayer, or we ask for, hey, what, uh, what's going on in your life? And in your mind, you know, you feel God telling you, confess, confess. But you say, no, everything's fine. Everything's good. And by that, we are slowly isolating ourselves. And as we, as, we, as we distance ourselves from each other, we actually distance ourselves from God as well. And the ramifications of that is that we see that, uh, that we keep away our friends and our family, right? 
research uh, after research tells of how guilt can lead to isolation and, and to, to damage a healthy social life, and which leads to feelings of loneliness. You know, this past um, Friday we went to, I was at a, I was at a conference that spoke about um, how to reach the next generation, but they talked about the number two epidemic in the world after pornography is loneliness. Loneliness. And we know this and we see this here in the Bay Area probably more than anywhere else. Why do you think there are so many community events? Why are there so many meetup.coms? There's so many uh, avenues of trying to find communities because people are lonely. We are human beings created for relationship and so we're desperate for people to really accept us and know us but we also are in fear of what if they don't accept me. And then when we pile that upon that as Christians, sometimes when in our sin and the, we, the things that we are ashamed about, we don't want people to find out. And in doing so, what happens is that we're actually trapping ourselves. We're enslaving ourselves to that sin. Other things that guilt and, and shame can lead to is that it, it destroys some, our self-esteem. In Psychology Today, an article, it said that a person with feelings of inadequacy may not feel worthy of love or being loved. Let me read that again for you. A person with feelings of inadequacy may not feel worthy of love or being loved. That sticks with me because I live that. Again, maybe you guys know my testimony. That when you feel that you are caught in a cycle of sin and you can't get out, you begin to isolate yourself from others. Your self-esteem goes down. You lose your identity. Even as a Christian, you begin to question it. You begin to question, does God love me? Can God love me? How many times have I failed? How many times have I turned against him? How many times have I sinned? How many times have I looked on, at what I wasn't supposed to on the computer? How many times have I gotten drunk or, or whatever substance abuse or whatever is going on in our lives? How many times must I fall? Slowly, our identity is lost. And we feel that we're not worthy of love or being loved. That ultimate cause lead us to depression, which is higher today, and especially amongst the younger generations, more than ever before. And the and study after study, WebMD said, you know, uh, symptoms of of depression are not just it's not just mental, emotional. There, there's physical, um, there's physical um, effects. Your your immune system is weakened. You have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Your weight, fu- your weight fluctuates. You either lose a ton of weight or you gain a ton of weight. Uh, many people can't sleep. And these are just things that we know that, that eat up at, at, at people as, as they let that guilt build up in their life. And so when, when the Proverbs, when Solomon, he reveals that whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. It's not about material gain. Is that when you when we hide our sin, when we keep it from others, when we keep it from God, the effects of it can be devastating in our relationships, in our physical, in, our, in in physically for us, emotionally, mentally, and and most importantly, is spiritually. In the Proverbs, says, he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. They will obtain the mercy of God. See, that's, that's why confession and repentance ought to be a beautiful thing. It takes all the ugliness of our sin. It takes all of our shame. It takes all of our guilt, all the things that we're scared about. And yet, it brings it to light. And yes, that, that can be painful. It can be embarrassing. But the cross of Jesus Christ says, yes, you are a sinner. Yes, you are messed up, as we all are. Still come to me. I love you. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ.
can't think that our sin is not a big deal. Some of us, we, we, oftentimes, we oftentimes, we think when, when it comes to confession, it's about the big things in our life, the big failures or the big stumbling blocks. But I can tell you that no big sin or no big event in your life happens without the first the small steps that lead up to it. You don't just naturally jump off a cliff. You've got to take the steps to walk off to the edge. And as you distance yourself, as you isolate yourself, as your self-esteem goes down, it becomes easier and easier to fall down that cliff. Easier and easier to fall into temptation. To live a life of wisdom. It's not just also about, again, it's not just about knowing what to do. It's knowing who God is and it's knowing who you are. That's the wisdom of confession. And there's three confessions that I think are important for us to make. Right? It's, um, and the funny thing is, is that as, as I was reading through scripture and, and I came across these, these three confessions, it, it, um, it mirrored something um, that a lot of people in this world are familiar with, but actually don't know the origins, and which is Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? Or Gamblers Anonymous, or Sex Addicts Anonymous, whatever it may be. Uh, the, what are they famous for? It's for their, their 12 steps to overcome addiction, right? And I'm just gonna read it real quickly to you guys. There's, there's 12 things here. Um, now, if you go to an AA meeting, God bless you for, for finding help, or if you're helping someone, but some, they omit the spiritual aspects of this, but the creator of this actually was very much so uh, in line with scripture. And it says the first one is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unma- un- unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God, and they add, as we understood him, okay, because they didn't want to be exclusive, right? Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Wow, that sounds familiar here. Six, we're, we're, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, make a list of all persons we have harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, may direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. 10, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it, all right? Continuing confession. 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. 12, Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Now, most people don't think about this, but everyone knows what AA is. Everyone knows what Alcoholics Anonymous is. Not everyone knows that actually these principles are rooted in Scripture. That it's rooted in the gospel. Because ultimately, confession of sin and repentance is us applying the truth of the gospel. Because it humbles us before a holy God, and it showers us with his grace and his love and his reconciliation with our creator. And it reflects in us a a, a heartfelt gratitude for what Jesus accomplished on the cross for us. Wisdom of confession. The three things that we need to confess or who we need to confess to. The first one is that we need to confess to yourself. You need to confess to yourself. First John 1 John 1.8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Basically, it's admitting that you know you're messed up. Admitting that you need help. Right? We confess. Um, what we're saying is that we view our sin and we view um, the things that displease God, we view them the same way that He does. 
We don't try to minimize them. We don't try to justify them. We accept them. See, again, as, as human beings, we're very good at justifying our actions. Not even just as Christians. Think about all the wars in the world that were justified by whatever means that people wanted to. And even in the history of Christianity, yeah, there are people who took advantage of that. But do we try to justify our sin? I think maybe one of the, the things that we uh, do most is we like to compare ourselves with others. Excuse me, it's really hot up here. Um, we like to compare ourselves with others. And for us, is as long as my sin is not worse than his or hers, then I'm good. Right? I'm generally a good person. Right? I don't cheat. I don't steal. I don't murder. Compare ourselves to fellow Christians, to the world around us, and say, generally, I'm a good person. And that's pervasive in the church. That's pervasive in the culture of the church because what we have failed to do, and I'm going to admit that what I, what I as a pastor have failed to do, is to preach and teach on the severity of sin and how we are indeed indebted to God because we can't earn our way to salvation. We can't build ourselves up to save ourselves. Confessing to ourselves means that we have a right view of ourself and a right view of God. A right view of sin, sorry. That we are sinners in need of grace. That we can't overcome sin on our own. And that we are weak and susceptible to sin. That sin is in us, even on our good days. See, confession and repentance, it wasn't a special, it's not supposed to be a special occasion. You know, when there's a worship night, or we have a praise evening, or, you know, every once in a while in, the, in our service. It's a daily walk with our Lord. It's a daily act of understanding our need for Him. That we are weak. That we are sinful. It's a daily reminder that sin is a big deal. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is a big deal a big deal to God, it ought to be a big deal to us. Because the hidden sin, uh, as, uh, the hidden sin leads to us not prospering or thriving and ultimately keeps us from God. Confess to yourself. The second confession is then we need, to, we need to confess to God. First John 1, 9 to 10 continues and he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I think sometimes just in the way that those with self, low self-esteem feel that they can't be loved or don't deserve to be loved, there's time we, f- we, we view God the same way. That we are, that God can't forgive us. That what we've done has, is so bad. It's so terrible. It's so shameful that there's no way I can be forgiven. And for some of us, it's not that you don't believe you can be forgiven. It's that you believe that you don't deserve to be forgiven. You know what? You don't deserve to be forgiven. But that's the beauty of the gospel even when we don't deserve it, even at our very worst, God forgives us. And this speaks to what do you believe about who God is? What do you believe about how God sees you? Romans 2, 4 to 5 says, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is, is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Again, when we speak of confession and repentance, oftentimes it feels like what's driving us is that guilt. And don't get me wrong, guilt can be a good thing at times because it's letting you know you did something wrong. If you never feel guilty, you don't feel that emotion. 
You might want to see a psychiatrist, okay? But what does, this, what does the Romans 2 say about God? It's his kindness. It's his patience towards us. That's meant to lead you to repent. See, we go to God, not out of fear that if I don't confess, then he's going to smite me. Or if I don't go to God, I'm going to go to hell. No, we go to God because we understand that in him we find the forgiveness that we're looking for. In him we find the acceptance that we're longing for. It's his kindness that leads us to his repentance. Confessing to God, it reveals we have a right view of him. If we're afraid to go to God, if we're scared to confess our sins to him, maybe we need to readjust what we believe about him. Scripture tells about him. He's faithful and just. He's forgiving. He is kind. He is patient with us. his kindness that leads, us, that leads us to repentance. I hope you see how God sees you. And I hope that you see God through the right eyes. Lastly, we need to confess to one another. And honestly, this is probably one of the hardest ones. We need to confess to one another. James 5, 16, first part, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. What, this is, what, what James there is, is speaking on is the importance of being transparent and honest in our lives. And I talked about that a little bit before. I can remember the first time um, I confessed my, my deepest, darkest sin, my, my deep, dark secret, the thing that I wish no one knew, I didn't want anyone to know. It was, uh, it was like my senior year of high school, and I had, a, uh, I had a friend that we grew up in church together. He was a year older, and so he was in college, and he came back. And, you know, through his fellowship, he really grew in, in his relationship with God. But he also recognized that even for, for us who we grew up together, I knew since, since I was five, there's a whole bunch of us, right, very much so like our youth here today, that they've known each other since they were five years old, four years old, since they are born. We recognized that we weren't really honest and transparent with each other if we didn't sh- share our whole lives with one another. And so it was a Saturday uh, afternoon, and we're gathered at our church. And at that time, there was a house that we owned next to the church, and that's where the college and high schools met. And we're there, and we're just sitting in a circle. And one by one, people are just confessing their sin. Now, I will say, man, that's a beautiful picture, right? But what do you think I was feeling at that time? I was like, oh, my God, they're coming to me soon. And I can remember my hands were, were, were sweaty, and my mind was racing. I was just like, oh, man, should, should I share? Should I share this? What, what are, what are they going to say? What are, uh, what are they going to think about me? Because to be honest, at the time, you know, yeah, I, I'm a PK. I'm a pastor's kid, you know. People kind of have a, a standard of how we ought to be, right? My parents didn't put that on me, okay? I put that on myself, just to be clear. Um, I served in leadership since I was in elementary school. I was teaching, I was teaching children's worship. But at the same time, I was struggling with this hidden sin. I was so scared. And I was like, and I made it in my mind, made up my mind, I'm not going to share. There's too much to lose. And that sin that many of you guys know is that, was that I, was, I was struggling with lust. I was struggling with looking at things on the internet that I shouldn't have at pornography. And, and I, I thought I was the only one. But then as, as my brothers, as they continue to confess, not everyone, one by one, like maybe like 80% of us, there's like about 15 of us in this room, they all shared that they struggled with it too. And in my mind, I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I thought I was alone. See, in, in our confession and repentance, sometimes we think that it's just for us. But it's actually when we can share that we struggle too, that we struggle in community, we see that we're not alone. I can't tell you how relieved I was that I could finally share with someone 
that I could finally confess my sins openly and say, this is what I've been struggling with, and I need help. But that would never have happened if, it would, if my, my, my friend didn't take that initiative to say, I'm going to start. We need to be in each other's lives. We need to be open and honest with one another. Because we all understood that we all had things hidden in our lives. And we all understood that it was actually hindering us from growing in our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. We struggle oftentimes in confessing our sins with others because, again, it's that fear. Because when we verbalize it and we speak it out loud, somehow it becomes more real. Right? It's the difference of praying, even in your private prayers and confessions, which are good or great, singing it out loud has a different feel to it. I'm on it. Seriously. Speak your prayers out loud, your confessions out loud to God. And the difference of it, because what happens is that it shines a light on it. And especially when you are with uh, fellow brothers or sisters in Christ, right, it, 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 the sin becomes concrete. It becomes just there. And you can't hide the ugliness of it. Then again, it's this. Do we view confession with fear or do we see it as an act of grace? We see it as something given to us by God that as we confess to one another, that's actually God's way of giving us his divine help. We are the body of Christ. We belong to one another. We need support. We need accountability. We need to know that, that God loves us. I'm, I, I've been a pastor only seven years, but I grew up in the church my whole life. I can tell you right now, every day, I need to be reminded that God loves me. Every day I need, to, I need someone to, to speak encouragement to my life. And it doesn't always happen, but, you know, I'm also blessed with my, my, my wonderful wife and, and some good brothers. But we need people regularly in our lives that can point us back to Jesus. That don't give us the, that doesn't give me the, hey, it's okay. No, it's okay you messed up. No, you'll get them next time. No. Point out my sin for what it is, but then point me to the incredible grace and love of God. That's what we need of each other. That's what it means that when we confess to one another, that we pray for each other, that we keep each other in prayer. James um, 5, verses 19 to 20 says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sin. Going back to Proverbs, it says that, uh, again, those who hide their transgressions will not prosper. But again, I said, these are general principles, but we still see wicked people prosper. But what we focus on is ultimately what is at stake here is not just our physical, or our mental, or emotional health. It's our spiritual destinies. What is at stake is our eternity. God designed, God designed his people to be in community. He designed us to not just share in the joys with one another, but also in our sorrows. To not only just learn about God's word, but to apply it. To not only just learn about what sin is, but to confess our sins to one another. And that's the challenge that I want to give to all of us. I want to ask you guys, when was the last time you confessed your sins to a brother or sister? When was the last time you acknowledged your need for, uh, for God? We need Confess to yourself, confess to God, and confess to one another. I want to leave with this, this quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was um, a pastor, you know, during World War II, during the whole um, 
Nazi um, regime. But he says this. He says, the grace of the gospel confronts us with the truth and says, you are a sinner, a great desperate sinner. Now come as the sinner you are to the God who loves you. In our confession and our repentance, we bring our guilt and we bring our shame to the God who loves us. There's nothing that you have done or you are doing right now that God cannot take away, that God cannot forgive, that would stop God from loving you. I think maybe that's something that some of you here need to hear that. You need to repeat that in your life, that God loves you despite everything. Despite your past, despite your present, even despite what you're going to do in the future, God loves you. But let's not isolate ourselves. Not, let, let us not keep to ourselves. But let us turn to him and turn to the body of Christ which he has given us to live out his gospel, to live that life of wisdom that shouts of who he is and his glory, which brings us a peace a joy, and a hope. As I close, you know, um, uh, the worship team's going to come up, but I want to lead us in actually in a time of repentance now. This isn't something that we do often, if, if, if I can recall. And, you know, for some of you, you can either, you can follow me in a prayer, or you can write it down in your response cards. And again, those response cards, no one sees except for the pastor's. So if you don't, if you feel like you still can't share with anyone, but you want to talk to a pastor, please do do write that down on your cards. At this time, no, we're not gonna. You're not gonna speak or anything like that. But I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads. Everyone, no, 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 looking around. No looking around, please. You close your eyes. I just want to do this. You don't have to say it, but if you have unconfessed sin in your life. You want to confess to God. You just raise your hand. No one's gonna look. No one's gonna look. Just raise your hand. You don't have to raise it high. Just even just raise a finger. There's sin in your life that you're so scared to share that you're ashamed of. Just raise your hand right now. I just want to pray for us. God. You are an amazing and wonderful God. That you gave up your life, your son for us. So that we would not be buried down or overwhelmed by our sin and our shame. But on that cross, you carried it for us, Lord. But we recognize, Lord, that we can't do anything apart from you, Lord. We recognize that there is sin in our life, that there are things that we are ashamed of, that we still carry guilt about, Lord. And that it's eating us up. That we carry that burden with us. But Lord, in you, may we find freedom in you, may we find healing in you, may we find the hope that you are who you say you are, that you are faithful and just, that you are patient and kind, that you are forgiving and gracious. And so we come to you in all of our nakedness and all of our sin and all of our shame, and yes, we sit and we claim out and we shout out that, yes, I am a sinner, Lord. Yes, I need you. We thank you, Lord, that in our cries, that in our prayers, you hear us. That in you we have found forgiveness. That we have received grace and mercy beyond our comprehension, Lord. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us here in this room, Lord. Maybe some of us, we need to look deep within ourselves and we need to confess to ourselves the sin that is in our lives. Maybe some of us, we need to turn to you again and just be reminded that it is the sin that took, that put your son on the cross, that put Jesus on the cross. But it's also that sin that was forgiven and taken with him in his death and his resurrection. And I want to pray, Lord, that we would not feel alone here. 
that as the body of Christ, that we will confess to one another, whether it's in our life groups or whether it's in our friendships or whether it's with our leaders or our pastor, Lord, that we are not ashamed because we know that our sins are covered by you, Lord. But may we as God's people, may we gather and may we rally around one another without judgment, without condemnation, Lord, because we know that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Lord, that together we remind each other of your incredible love, incredible grace, Lord that we would point each other to you. Confess, Lord, that we need you. We trust who you are and what you've done for us on that cross. We praise you and we thank you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned